Good morning, everyone. Um, so my name is Ben Dean. I work at Blizzard, uh, and I like to use good coding styles. And this talk is entitled Declarative Style in C++. Now, you might be wondering, you know, you might be wondering about declarative style. One of the reviewers <laughs> for this talk said, every time I hear about this, the definition seems hand wavy. Uh, I'm going to try and give concrete guidelines. I'm going to try not to be hand wavy. This talk is going to be part philosophy, part history, hopefully a good part pragmatism. Uh, I'm not going to give you a lot of pure functional rabbit holing. So although there is an overlap between declarative style and functional programming, um, functional programming isn't, isn't fundamentally what C++ is about. So I'm going to try and find specific guidelines that will fit with C++ as we know it today, as a large multi-paradigm language. So this is a bit about what I'm going to talk about. I'm going to look at the history of, uh, of programming and C++ and current practices that exist, so how we got here, looking at it through a declarative lens and trying to extract <coughs> things that we can think about. And I'm going to see how to apply declarative principles to our C++ to make it better uh, in the context of being in a multi-paradigm language that, of course, isn't always necessarily amenable to naive, pure functional techniques, <laughs> declarative techniques. So what do we mean by declarative programming? Well, my first stop, of course, was Wikipedia. And Wikipedia says that uh, it expresses the logic of computation without describing the control flow. So this, this removing control flow complexity is an important idea. You might be thinking, well, control flow is sort of important. <coughs> I'm not sure we can ditch it entirely. Uh, I'll expand on this as we go. So wiki.c2.com, this is uh, Ward Cunningham's original wiki and it's home to the informal history of programming ideas. This talks about declarative style in sort of talking more about something like Prolog than C++. Um, but one thing it does say is that uh, declarative style should not, uh, order of statements shouldn't affect semantics and replication <laughs> of statements shouldn't affect semantics. So these are some, some ideas we're starting to get about what declarative style means. Now, if I asked you to classify languages, you might give me you know, some, some broad classifications like uh, imperative languages, things uh, object-oriented like Smalltalk or Java, or functional languages. These are the sort of major language classifications. Uh, and there are more. But if, one of the things I find when I start to do this is if we look at general purpose languages like C++, especially uh, over the last 30 or 40 years, they resist strict classification. Uh, it's a bit like trying to classify music. It, it, res it resists, you know, Classical music is, means anything from Baroque to John Williams. So on this list, you can even program Haskell kind of imperatively if you want. Um, and so C++, we would say, encompasses all of these uh, paradigms, at least, and probably generic also. Now, something else you might be wondering about with declarative code is, is it about reducing line count? So <coughs> it's sort of an uncomfortable statistic to me that bug count does correlate with line count. Um, but like any statistic, we can find good counterexamples. You know, it's a bit like saying, on average, men are taller than women. Yes, on average. Any particular, uh, any particular example we take, we can't apply that rule to. Um, and what it's about really is decreasing complexity <laughs> rather than decreasing line count. One of the important tools for decreasing complexity is idiom, and that can, that can increase line count, of course. So decreasing line count isn't a goal in and of itself. On the other hand, I'm reminded of the famous misquoted phrase, uh, my apologies for writing you a long program, I didn't have time to write a short one. <laughs> <laughs> so, you know, it's, it's perhaps the case that when we write fewer lines, we think more about them. Now, one, one last thing to say here. One of the other reviewers for this talk said that um, declarative programming is everyone's dream. Obviously, it's all your dream. Because uh, it looks like it's easier to prove correct. Now, I saw this and I thought, <coughs> Prove is a very strong word. There will be no proofs in this talk. My apologies for those of you hoping for rigor. Um, but I would say rather that it's easier to convince ourselves that declarative style is correct. All right, so to me, some declarative style is not a hard and fast thing, but it's a way of tailoring the code. Um, and we can think about some indicators. So one indicator is referential transparency, the idea that functions should only, the output should only depend on the inputs and not on some 
state that's kept between <coughs> function calls or is global. Um, a big thing is saying what the code does in preference to how, that's in line with Wikipedia. It's about minimizing imperative style to me. These two things are sort of in opposition. Uh, not about getting rid of it completely, but about minimizing it where we can. Of course, at the risk of being etymo etymologically reductive, it is about declaring things. And so one of the fundamental things I think it's about is using expressions, preferring expressions over statements. So let's take a look at expressions and statements and compare and contrast them and see what we can discover. So what does the standard say about expressions? So it actually has a lot to say about expressions in general before it even goes into detail about what kinds of expressions we can make in C++. It says an expression is a sequence of operators and operands and an expression can result in a value and cause side effects. And then <coughs> it goes on to give properties of expressions. It says expressions have value categories and expressions have types. It also says expressions have a context, but that's not important for this talk. Um, so expressions have intrinsic properties that can be reasoned about. In particular, expressions compose, and they compose on multiple axes. So this is just any three expressions, A, B, C, and, uh, and their result, and at is any operator. So we can say about this, there are two axes that expressions compose on. The value axis, <coughs> obviously A, B, and C all can be evaluated to values, an expression has a value. Uh, and then they have types, so they compose on the type axis. And of course value composition happens at runtime, and type composition happens at compile time. So type composition can be checked. Now what does the standard say about <coughs> statements? Not a whole lot. It pretty much says this, except, except as indicated, <laughs> statements are executed in sequence. Uh, and doesn't have much to say about properties of statements. Statements are defined by the standard extrinsically, just by enumerating the different kind of statements that we can write. So there are no real intrinsic properties of statements that the standard, that the standard addresses. Um, so statements compose pretty much only by sequencing in time. There's no direct way that we have to constrain this. The compiler doesn't help a whole lot with this compared to how much it helps with expressions. <coughs> we, we're used to doing some value checking with asserts, but assert, of course, itself isn't a statement. It is a statement. So assert checking is intrusive because it's inserting a st another statement into your statements. Um, now, we also have implicit constraints, and we, we put a lot of brain power at, at this conference into these kind of things. Uh, implicit constraints, preconditions, postconditions, uh, but when you come down to it, our ability as humans to reason temporally is pretty poor. Um, Dijkstra, that famous computer science curmudgeon, said, our intellectual powers are rather geared to master static relations, and our powers to visualize processes evolving in time are relatively poorly developed. In fact, this is a really important point to me. Um, we put so much effort into controlling statements. We make conventions. We make guidelines, we make tools. We like to run multiple static analyzers to get different benefits from each. We make libraries in support of tools. We add things to the language like <coughs> contracts. We have great minds like Lisa working to bring formal reasoning to statement flow. And this is great, this, this is great. But there is an alternative which is to rely on expressions rather than statements and try to get what the compiler can give us because after all, We've been doing. We've been trying to attack this problem a lot in recent years. You know, we could probably say, I don't know, ten years, fifteen years, practice of tooling and things like that. Uh, but compilers have sixty years of of uh, analyzing expressions. That was basically a solved problem fifty or sixty years ago. So, the kind of top level guide for, guideline for this talk is, let's try to avoid statements where we can. Um, declarative style is essentially, to me, a preference for avoiding statements. Here are the statements available to us. Now, this isn't the complete list, but this is a pretty good representation of the statements that we use most of the time. Um, for the, and for the language lawyers out there, I left out uh, compound statements because they're sort of second order effects of what you get with statements. Um, and I left out tri blocks, and I left out uh, atomic synchronized blocks from the 
transactional memory TS. <coughs> We're not going to talk about that today. Uh, so only, to me, only the last of these, a declaration statement, fits with declarative style. And as a goal, we should try to avoid most of the rest where we can. <coughs> now, of course, it's not a hard and fast rule, it's a goal. And it may sound odd at first, but I hope to show you today that when you look at existing practice through the lens of a declarative style, you'll see that we do already have a preference for avoiding statements, even if we don't realize it. <coughs> so let's take a look at history. How did we get here? How did, we, uh, how did C++ evolve from languages before it? And what does that tell us about moving to declarative style? So first of all, I want to look at expression statements. And uh, cppreference.com says, most statements in a typical C++ program are expression statements, such as assignments or function calls. And I want to put my sights on assignment first. So no doubt, no doubt you're all familiar with this uh, famous <coughs> piece of code, sometimes called the world lo world's last bug. You can all see the bug, right? <laughs> Uh, yeah, it's very famous. Uh, there are actually two strange things in this code. So, so, and I want to see how history got us here. So thing number one that I find strange is that assignment is an expression. So this is my opinion. Assignment as an expression is a historical choice. I don't think it's doing us any favors today. I don't know whether this is particularly controversial to say, but based on the practices I see, I don't think it is. So, so I want to tell you a little story. When I was at university, of course, uh, my friends and I learned C. And C was great, and it made us feel really powerful. We were used to doing all kinds of questionable things in C. <laughs> and then in the second year, we learned Modular 3, which is a language in the Pascal family. We learned it as a teaching tool for object orientation. And, and being kind of semi-experienced C programmers and used to programming C, when we came to programming Modular 3, we frequently ran up against a particular error. The Modular 3 compiler would tell us, in no uncertain terms, expression is not a statement. Quite right, too. Um, so Modular 3 has no expression statement, unlike C++, <coughs> unlike C. Uh, expressions and statements never meet. <coughs> so this didn't start, of course, with Modular 3. Uh, I mean, I mean with, with C, the fact that expressions can be statements. Uh, there were expression-oriented languages around before C. Uh, almost from the dawn of programming. So Algol uh, and Lisp were both expression-oriented. So we need to go back a bit further. All right, who can tell me what language this is? There are no typos here. That, that, this is close, this is B. I had to tell my syntax highlighter it was C because it doesn't know how to highlight B. <laughs> <laughs> so, <laughs> this, this is B, which is the precursor of C, of course. Uh, so we're going back a little further. Um, in fact, a lot of things that happened in B are things that we've inherited. Uh, and, and someone mentioned BCPL. Yeah, B was descended from Martin Richards' BCPL uh, in 90, late, the tail, very tail end of the 60s. Uh, BCPL had an assignment command, not an assignment expression. But here you can see assignment is an expression. So we've learned to deal with this. But, but we don't really like it. And, and I can see that we don't really like it because we invent things like Yoda conditions to protect us against it. Um, and of course, Yoda conditions are a bit out of favor now because we've replaced them with nice compiler warnings. Um, and even more modern, we have things like P0963. This is a paper which proposed making structured binding declarations usable directly as a condition rather than having the colon, uh, semicolon condition after the init part of the if init. And this was shot down uh, at uh, the recent Standards Committee meeting. So all of this tells me that we, we don't actually like assignments as expressions. So why did it happen? Like, was there something in the B program language that was it down to the uh, level? It's just like that's what is a consequence of the architecture? Why did it happen? Well, uh, assignments as expressions happened in like the early languages like Lisp, because that was just the computational paradigm. Uh, the computational paradigm was evaluating expressions. And if you wanted an assignment, I suppose, it had to be an expression. I, I can offer you no explanation as to why it was carried forward into other languages. 
Uh, if Right. So, so people like to write, like to write, chained assignments. Um, I don't like to write chained assignments. Maybe uh, Ken Thompson liked to write chained assignments, probably. <coughs> I don't know. You have to ask him. OK, so I mentioned there are two things that were odd in here. So the other thing that was odd, now, in the first, first time I put this up, I omitted this comment. Otherwise, it's the same snippet of V. So the odd thing that's, that's here is that the equal sign <coughs> means assignment, not equality. It's worth asking why it's that way. We're totally used to it today. But uh, this was not viewed as a good thing at the time. Nicolaus Wirt said this. He said it overthrows a century-old tradition to let equals denote a comparison, a predicate which is either true or false. And he also noted that it puts the operands on unequal footing. Because A equality B, they're both on equal footing, but A equals B, they're very much, oh, A assign B, they're very much not. So Niklaus Wirt, not really a fan of operator overloading. <coughs> but we'll come back to this. <coughs> How do we get to equals meaning uh, assignment rather than equality? Well, just a little historical diversion. The 50s and 60s was an incredible time for programming language innovation. So this language called Superplan, as far as I can tell, introduced equals for assignment. It also introduced the for loop, so we can thank it for that. And then Fortran in 1957 came along. Fortran was like the, the super famous language, obviously. Uh, but because of, because of restricted character sets, it used these glyph, these funny incantations for greater than, less than, et cetera. And that freed up the use of the equal sign for assignment. And then Algol 58 introduced assignment distinct from equality. And this was followed by many kind of Pascal family languages, <coughs> including BCPL, which is interesting. And then B came along, and B cut down and simplified loads of BCPL syntax. So that was where I think we can trace our immediate lineage back to equals for assignment. Of course, B was followed by C and many other languages since. And in making this choice, Ken Thompson said, assignment is about twice as frequent as equality testing, so the operator should be half as long. I would like to challenge this statement today. <laughs> um, but you know, he had a great reason for doing it. And his reason was he wanted to fit BCPL on the PDP-7. Now, at the time, the BCPL, Martin Richards BCPL compiler was 16K. That was massive. And the PDP-7 had 4K of memory. I mean, these, these things are amazing to think about today. So Ken Thompson did an amazing job in taking BCPL and trimming absolutely everything he could to make B and fitting it on the PDP-7. But the distinction between declaration and reassignment was lost. Now, we, and we have this heritage in C++ today. Now, we know if we look at these two things, they're different. If that, you know, int a equals 42, we know, well, how about, you know, not for int, but for a class, we would know that that doesn't call the assignment operator, right? We all know that. Uh, but it looks the same as assignment. <coughs> and Biana said, of course, in the C++ programming language that this cannot be overemphasized, that these things are different operations. All right, end of historical diversion. What does that look at history tell us about programming style, especially declarative style? It tells me that assignment as an expression is a historical, lazy convenience today that doesn't do us any favors. And, and expression statements have always been sort of a trap for the unwary. And that's why we, today we have things like warnings, we have things like if initializers, we have things like no discard attribute. These all protect us against expression statements. Declaring things has always been fine. Declaration and assignment are completely different. And Assignment as an expression is best avoided. All right, so I'm going to be coming back to this table as we go. I've been attacking assignment. <laughs> it's looking on shaky ground. Um, so this is where we are right now. Uh, I'm, going to, I'm going to attack, except for declaration. I like declaration. Um, but the rest of them, I'm going to show you how, how kind of current practice actually leads us away from 
from this. So let's take a quick snippet of C++ and, and put it, give us a declarative study. A fairly common code snippet and examine ways to write it in different ways. So given some, some weak footer, uh, we want to get, we want to lock it and get something out of it. And here's how we might write this today. Uh, it's, not, it's not particularly declarative yet, but this piece of code would likely, at least on my team, this would pass code review. Uh, it's the best we can do with our kind of imp imperative style, and it's ticking several guideline boxes. It's, it's scoping the shared putter so that you know, we just hold on to it as long as we need to. But it's still unsatisfying to me. It's got a declaration initialization split. It's got some mutable state, therefore. And, and yeah, it's got this conventional scope control. And, and so here I'm using the, the example of weak putter and shared putter. As it's, you can think of it as anything, this is a stand-in for anything that requires this kind of pattern, holds a resource, you want to get something out of it. So it's not necessarily just for shared putter. Now, of course, I know many of you are thinking already different ways to, to write this, and here's one way. In C++17, we get if initialization. Uh, it's better. It still has this declaration initialization split. This is preventing us from marking bar as const, or, or b as const. Uh, this, is, this is, in my mind, a workaround for assignment being an expression, because I, I could very well see uh, the old assignment as an expression in the if condition being replaced with this pattern. And I think, I think that will become the case in, in, as, we, as we see if initialization get taken up. Now, something else we could do, of course, is use the conditional operator. I'm, I'm sure not many of you are liking this. I, I think this works. Someone might tell me different, but I, you know, the, so the temp, there's no, I don't think there's a race here because this will live to the semicolon. But of course, we are locking the weak pointer twice. So, <coughs> not good. Someone could correct me on that. On that. So, so the, <laughs> the first lock will extend I, the lifespan of whatever it created at the end of the expression. I, I believe so, unless someone can help me differently. I think so. I, I believe that's correct. Yeah. So, so yes, right. What was the question? <laughs> so, 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 so yes. Some, some questioning about whether this works. Uh, the consensus is this does work because this lock gets lifetime extended until the semicolon. So. There's no race here. The comment is, it works, but it's really ugly. Gashper. There's a proposal out for allowing ternaries with initialization. You mean something like this? <laughs> <laughs> There's a proposal for allowing ternaries with initializers. <laughs> yeah, this would be great. And this speaks to me. So, so we sort of think of the conditional operator as being the same as the, the if statement. It, this tells me that it, it really isn't. Yes. Yes, the comment is this, this is this can be difficult for parsing, I think is the yeah. <laughs> is this is the sentiment, Richard. But could you have it configured the same thing with say a lambda? Uh, that you yeah. like People are foreshadowing <laughs> upcoming slides. <laughs> 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 All right, so so there is some of you may know there is a GCC extension called we have expression statements. This is called a statement expression. <laughs> not not confusing at all. So this is actually so this is assigning the value of this expression, which is a statement expression, <coughs> to, to b. Uh, this is basically a compound statement whose value is its last expression. This is somewhat similar to how functional languages might work, where the value of the uh, expression is the last thing. Of course, this isn't ISO C++, but this is very similar to what many of you are now thinking, which is, I started calling it you know, i plus le, because you can put as many i's as you like in immediately invoke inline initializing lambda expression. Um, and this might, this, depending on your code base style, this might be fine. This is very much in vogue at the moment. This, of course, allows us to avoid the declaration initialization split. We can make bar const. Uh, we can make b const. We can put auto there if, we, if that's our style. There are a couple of other ways we could write this. <coughs> we could put an optional-like behavior on, uh, on the shared putter. This is hard to make generic uh, because we don't have the ability to sort of reflect over names of things that we're getting. But it's, it's one option. Another option is that we could put a functorial slash monadic interface on shared putter and map, map the function into the shared putter. 
And you know, depending, again, depending on your code base style, this might be OK. This isn't a kind of thing that I would use in my code base necessarily. Uh, note the no discard attribute here. That's the piece of imperative safety gear that helps us avoid the pitfalls of statements. So conclusions about this. C++ is multi-paradigm. Real, total declarative style, not always achievable. But a more declarative style is, to me, a reasonable goal. And there are plenty of features of C++ that help us get there. Uh, and the other thing is, like, yeah, different domains and different styles of code in your code base lead you to make different uh, choices. But the key idea is to try and minimize statements and maximize the use of expressions, which maximizes the help the compiler can give us. So let's move on and take a little bit more of a look about existing practice uh, and look through a, a declarative lens. So here are some core guidelines, a selection of them. Of course, uh, ES21 and ES22 have been doing, we've been doing those forever because the ability to declare variables at the point of use is one of the things that separates C++ from C. Uh, we have a lot of things uh, that can be const at declaration. You just watch a few episodes of C++ Weekly and you'll see plenty of that. So we have all these guidelines that are leading us away from assignment and more towards don't declare something until you can put a value in it. So to me, assignment, <coughs> oh no. On my screen, there's a little skull there. <laughs> anyway, absence of heart. Let me see if that, <coughs> okay. Emoji fail, sorry about that. So assignment, gone, just read that as gone. <coughs> or at least minimized. No love, no love for assignment. Uh, so we try to avoid assignment after initialization and assignment as an expression. <laughs> and that allows us to take advantage of things like immutability for correctness, for performance, optimizations like RVO. It reduces the need for scoping and auxiliary variables and therefore reduces the need for compound statements. So functions in general, I'm assuming that, that we like. This is, this is sort of an example from Tony's talk last year. Uh, the number of times you need to see the same code to make a function is, is one. So we like functions. Why do we like functions? Well, the normal reasons people give for liking, liking functions are, are all of these. And, and these are great reasons. I like functions for these reasons. There is another reason I like functions in a declarative mindset, which is that what functions do is they turn statements into expressions. And return is a socially acceptable go-to in this sense. <laughs> uh, so I'm not a fan of one exit path per function. Uh, I don't think that's controversial. In C++, we have our AII, and, and, and sort of the structured programming ideal of one exit per function is uh, an anti-pattern in C++. Uh, if you saw Kevlin Henney's recent talk, he talked a lot about uh, structured programming and clarified the one exit path per function guideline. Uh, it's interesting to note that, so I looked it up, and one of the top answers on Stack Overflow, uh, the notion of single exit of a function was introduced with structured programming. And the, the programming sort of, the thing, the thing at the time was Fortran, right? Uh, and Fortran also has this idea of multiple <laughs> exits not, not from different places in the function, but multiple returns to different places. Because it had this kind of an error idea, or they had this idea of an alternate return for an error. So that at least, uh, I think, is addressed by this idea of single exit per function. But of course, I like return. Return is good for all these reasons. And functions turn statements into expressions. Now, one of the other things we hear a lot is no raw loops. What does that mean? That, that is a subset of strive for declarative code to me. Uh, it exhorts us to take these statement types and push them down out of the business logic, encapsulate them in something that has a name, and make our code at the point of the business logic uh, much more straight line, not dealing with special cases, and algorithms have names. They're very declarative. They declare what's going on. So here's a few of the algorithms in my toolkit. None of them is particularly groundbreaking. Most of them are little more than rebrandings of one-liners. Uh, is prefix of is a simple wrapper around stood mismatch, for example. Uh, but what they do is avoid statements 
in the business logic. They simplify the control flow. And one of the key points of all well-written algorithms is they deal with edge cases. Primarily, the, the most common edge case is, of course, the empty range. You don't have to put conditions or loops in your code to deal with this kind of thing when you have an algorithm or a function to call. So no love for iteration or jumps. These, things, these are things we like to push down into, into algorithms, into functions, and not have raw loops in our code. Um, initialization guidelines, as I said before, already helps us avoid assignments. Now, you're probably wondering about conditions. They're very, they're very common, right? They're, they're kind of essential to how we write code, you might think. Let's have a look at how to avoid conditions. We're already doing it. Let's talk about some declarative domains and patterns. This is from Catch. Uh, now, testing uses macros to hide the constructor RAII <laughs> stuff, typically. And it also uses global state. Um, one of the points I want to make with this slide is that declarative style is not incompatible with, with global state, because sometimes you have to do what you have to do. <coughs> so declarative style isn't pure FP or nothing. Um, but tests are idempotent. There's no dependency between them. At least that's a good guideline. Like if you have dependencies between your tests, that's usually a bad thing. And any good testing framework allows you to <coughs> randomize the order of tests. Uh, of course, it's leveraging RAII. And there's, in recent years, this popularity of declarative style tests emphasizing sections over fixture management. So that's one example of a domain which is very declarative. <clears throat> now, here's an example of a domain which used to be imperative, and I would argue now has turned much more declarative, actually in two different ways. So logging, right? The, the top line is how we might have done logging in 1980 with C. And the bottom is how we might do logging today. Um, I'm assuming that uh, many of you sort of have logging some, something like this in your code base. Uh, I certainly do, and I've seen it, you know, it's in the LLVM code base, for example. Some, some kind of logging like this using something like this. So what have we gained in going from the top to the bottom? Composability is a huge thing that we've gained. We can, we can add as many things to the log as we like using the output stream operator. We've gained the ability to extend logging for our own types. So in printf, the set of things that are recognized in the format string is fixed. We can't actually add anything to that. We've gained type checking. Now, yes, with constant expert trickery, it is possible to make sure that there are, there are enough things here that match up with the types here. Uh, but you know, this, this, is, this does that much more easily. The worst we can expect here is an unexpected conversion, perhaps, to something that has an output iterator. And usually, that usually would show up in a log. It wouldn't <coughs> cause a, a crash like a problem here. All of your types, I guess you would have to have an implicit sort of uh, way of converting it, but how is that different from the second one? Like everything that right. you want to have to alter to be the same. The, the comment is that the second line here could be achieved by having everything as a string here. And having that, a that, separate function. I mean, that that's, that's true. So, so <laughs> you know, th in some sense, this is a straw man. I'm going to look at how we might write both of these in a more declarative style. Uh, or at least how we might have done declarative on top. Um, the first thing I want to say is a little bit about just setting up what the slides are that are coming. In, on the top, you can obviously see there is a global variable there, uh, typical of a program that might be written in the early 80s. And on the bottom, a global variable is lurking somewhere, right? Uh, now, the global variable here is the idea, of, both of these are the idea of there is a there is a sync that will receive our logs. Uh, there, is a, there is some variable that these log, some place these logs go to. Let's look at the, that log sync interface, because uh, that's a good example of you know, things turned declarative, and how really current practice is using a declarative style. Now in, in C, if we wanted to change where the log went, 
if this was the 70s or the 80s. We would likely write logs to stood out or stood er, and we'd change the destination on the shell. We'd use <coughs> pipes, we'd use T, whatever, and that'd be fine for small console apps. If we were writing larger apps, we want more control over these logs and the ability to wrangle logging options at runtime. So in the C style, we'd probably encapsulate this in our own function, likely one of the V prefixed uh, varogs printf functions. In object-oriented style, we would start with composition. Right? So this is, this, is a this is the fundamental interface to a log sync. Uh, it takes that log line, that log entry, and it, and it pushes it somewhere. You know? uh, and importantly, it returns a Boolean to say whether or not it accepted that log entry. So this log sync thing is the thing that takes the place of the global file pointer. And I'm deliberately sort of expressing this in traditional object-oriented style to show you that you know, uh, old stuff, you know, many people here might think of you know, object-oriented style as kind of old um, compared to more modern, generic, functional kind of styles. But it's the case that good object-oriented design is good declarative style. So the key here is composition. With just this basic interface on a log sync, we have a lot of choices in what we can do. We can make a sync, for example, that pushes things to a file, or pushes things to the debug window. Those are, those are easy options. Or you know, along these lines is also pushing things to a listening network service. Because it returns a bool, we can make a sync that filters and looks for things in the logs. So I can you know, put my name in a log line if, if one of my testers, if this should occur, and my <laughs> tester sees my name, he should tell me, and I can make sure that gets filtered to the right place. We can wrap a sync, and we can give it an execution policy. So we can implement threaded logging or deferred flushing. And this would just pass through, you know, handle the threading or whatever, pass through to the, to the underlying sync. We can write a sync that uh, wraps multiple other syncs and fans out a log line to them. And we can parameterize that <laughs> on whether it will stop at the first one that accepts a sync, because, of course, push returns a ball, or you know, fan out to all of them. And perhaps most importantly of all, we can make the null sync that simply does nothing with the entry and says, OK, I accepted that. <coughs> so. What's the goal with all of these variations? This is, I think, good object-oriented design. This is the tell, don't ask principle. We're encapsulating conditions using polymorphism. That's what object-oriented design fundamentally does. You may notice a similarity here between the action of a log sync and the action of a smart output iterator, if you were at Jonathan Bakara's talk. And then when we construct a sync, well, again, I'm, I'm deliberately not using uh, uh, type erasure. I'm doing this in old style object oriented stuff on the heap uh, to show you that uh, good OO style does this. And we call it things like the null object pattern or dependency injection. They're all about encapsulating the conditions inside the class. And then you're either pushing the choice up the call stack. Uh, sorry, yeah, you're pushing the choice, the condition, you're pushing it up the call stack to the point of construction of the object. You're putting the, the power in the hands of the person who is using your system and encapsulating it using polymorphism. And of course, this is a great example of the initially, uh, the I plus LE. <coughs> uh, yeah, this is also a limitation of the, the conditional operator, of course, if I were to use, you might think I could replace this with a conditional operator, but these things don't have a common type. So although they are both unique putters to sinks, the conditional operator doesn't work here. So conventional op op object-oriented style uh, leads us to encapsulating conditions. So. Selection statements killed off by paradigm shift, which sounds like a way to die in NetHack, uh, but 
<laughs> that's, that's sort of what object-oriented style tells us. A uh, little bit more on that. So let's look at design patterns. Um, there are several patterns that lead towards declarative style, particularly in this way, and it's also, again, about replacing conditions with polymorphism. These <coughs> patterns have long been my favorites. I didn't really know why until I started thinking about how they work in declarative style. So the null object pattern allows you to you know, turn, turn that condition off at the construction time instead of every time you, you call the, the function. Composite. Composite is probably my favorite. That, again, that's the one that, that allows you to treat parts and whole, uh, parts, and parts of a hierarchy uh, the same way as, as whole hierarchies. Uh, but these days, there is one particular construction pattern uh, that comes up in declarative style. And that's the, well, we call it the builder pattern. It's not the original Gang of Four builder pattern, but it's also known as fluent style. <laughs> and the Wikipedia article for this, the Wikipedia example, <laughs> is not particularly compelling. So Nicola recently tweeted, the author turns what should be five lines of Gluck calls at the beginning of main into 100 lines of buggy OOP. You can, imagine, you can imagine the class that's written to back this code. And yes, it's, it's a lot of code. I, I'm not sure buggy, I'm not sure I level buggy at it, but you know, it's a lot of code. So the odds are that there are more bugs than a few lines of code. So this, is, this fluent style seems to be you know, this isn't a good example. So is fluent style something we want to use in C++? I have a couple of better examples, I think. Um, and, and so one of the problems with this is it's a one-use thing, right? It, it's not, <laughs> it's called the builder pattern uh, with, with the sense that you're probably going to build lots of things. Um, this is one use. It has lot, it's doing a lot of different things. There's a lot of different verbs here. There's no particular strong typing. So I have better examples of the builder pattern. <coughs> Here is, I think, a much better example of a builder pattern. Building a schedule is something that happens all over the code. You know, in, in my code, I work in, I work in networks, uh, network games, things like that. Exponential back off from a failed network call is something I have to do quite a lot. Building a schedule like this, the builder pattern here calling then, and using types to help us, it's very readable. We do it all over the code. This is using this is a good example of fluent style, I think. Uh, so one of the things is it encourages our value usage, right? We would never have a particular reason to make one of these things as an L value. So if it reads nicely as an R value, then that's probably a good thing. And it's correct sort of by construction. You can see it does what it does. There's only one verb. There's types helping us out. Of course, in C++17, we've got a bit of help for this fluent pattern, uh, which is the evaluation order guarantees, which have you know, <laughs> tweaked up some of the ways that uh, things are evaluated to make, to make this work. So, so before C++17, remember that the, the, the order evaluation of function arguments is unspecified. It's, it's still unspecified, but I believe it used to be interleavable, and now it's not. So what the standard now says is that these calls to s.find, so the problem before is that uh, before you replace this thing, you could find even in it, and then you've evaluated this function argument, but then after you replace the beginning, obviously the, <laughs> the, the position of even has changed. So uh, this example is actually from, from uh, Bjarne's book. Uh, and it's kind of a famous one. It didn't, it didn't work before C++17, probably. It, which is to say, it probably did work, depending on your compiler. <laughs> <coughs> but with C++17, we now have this uh, slightly stronger guarantees about evaluation order. So it helps fluent style interfaces. I'm going to show you another example of fluent style interface, which, uh, which I think is a good place where we can use strong types. So this example is we want to build a request object to send over the network, right? And typically, when we build a request, a couple of fields are required, maybe, and a bunch of others are optional. And we might, you know, we might provide a constructor which takes the required fields, and that would be fine. But sometimes we want we don't quite want to build it all in one go. We might want to build part of it and then pass it off and then fill in more. So how can we 
I sort of did this as a coding cutter, and I thought, how can we use strong types to, to help with this? We want to <coughs> prevent send request from sending an ill-formed request. Today, in code that I commonly see, uh, if we fail to fill in the required fields, then either we just assert here, or we'd send the thing anyway and get a protocol error and deal with that. But what we want is to leverage expressions over statements, and we want to leverage types to, for it to fail to compile. So here's one way to do that. So, so, so OK, so here's the, here's the class as it might exist today. Right, so this is what we're sort of attacking. <coughs> Normal. <coughs> Here, so set, setting fields is, is idempotent, and, and an, another idempotent thing is clearing things out of a bit field. So we're going to encode which fields have been set by clearing bits in a bit field. So <coughs> it's all going to work inverse. So all fields, we're going to make a thing with all fields uh, uns unset, and then as we set them, we're going to clear the bits. And we're, of course, we're going to encode that in a type. So we're going to use that as a non-type template parameter. <coughs> and in, in the base version of the type, we're actually going to have all the functionality <coughs> that doesn't depend on this. So all the fields live there, all the sort of other, other member functions other than the setters, I guess. And then we simply, we, we, what we do is have this recursive definition of request, which, which inherits from the request one down. So everything ultimately inherits from request of zero. And because its inheritance, you know, a, a, a derived class is a base class, or an instance of the derived class is, is an instance of the base class. So in our setters, ordinarily in the builder pattern, we'd return L value reference to, to this. We can return L value reference to the, this with the, effectively this with the field cleared. <coughs> and what this does is, so every time we, when we set a request, uh, when we set a required field, uh, it will clear that bit, and we'll, we'll continue to be able to chain things, because these functions still exist in all of the all of the n things here, and we end up with code. Uh, we can write send request in a way that only allows us to pass in a thing where the required fields have already been set. Setting an optional field just as an ordinary uh, doesn't clear any bits. <coughs> so, so yeah, setting an optional field doesn't re doesn't just returns a pointed to th uh, reference to this. Setting a required field returns reference to this, but of the type, which is a base class. So it's it's cleared the it's cleared the bit field. It's cleared the bit from the type. So it's casting. It's it's casting up the yeah. It's it's an, it's an implicit cast to a base. Arthur. Yeah, Arthur points out that that a request with no field set is implicitly convertible to a request with all field set, uh, bec because yes, a derived class is implicitly convertible to a base class. So that's why send request becomes a template function that's deleted for everything except the optional field. So this is a better match for the thing with the fields not set, but it's deleted. So this only allows us to call it with all the required fields set. So if you'll notice, this is, this is actually just using the language. There's no enable if machinery here. There's no heavy duty template stuff. A well-formed request, assuming that request has relatively few required fields, which they normally do, a, a well-formed well code will result in relatively few template instantiations. So to me, this is a nice use of, of strong typing to help us with the builder pattern. Gashba. Two to the n to the number of fields. Yes. So, it, okay. So, if you have n, yes, it'll 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 be n. Yes, it'll be. Yeah, we have. So we have three three bits here. But you have to do them in every order because the. You have to do them in every order. So there are there are three bits here. So you'll get set, uh, eight. Yeah. Yes, you can set them in any order. Yeah. Yes, you can set them in any, in, in, in any order. Um, you, 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 
So, oh, I'm going backwards. So I mentioned this just as an example of using <laughs> strong types. You could, you could, you could rewrite this to uh, specify that they must be set in a certain order. All right, so uh, my guidelines for using this builder pattern, sorry, question at the back. The error message, if you don't set the required fields, is that you're trying to use a deleted function. <coughs> How can you recognize which field? To b to it, it's in the type, to be honest, I would say, do a code review. <laughs> it's because it's not that the, 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 test, the, the, the error messages are particularly horrible with this, uh, but it's likely to be easy to spot which field you didn't use when you only have a few required fields. Yeah, yes, yes. The, the compiler will tell you the, the, bit, the bit field, which integer went into this, this class. So, so my guidelines for using fluent style, uh, they work really well when you have a, a single verb or a couple of verbs, unlike that, the, the glut example we saw. Uh, they work when you'll be building objects a lot. So again, the glut example was not, was not good because that's something you typically do once. Making types work for you works really well with the builder pattern. And, and it's best when, when, like I say, it encourages R values to be passed in. So when the R values aren't too verbose, it works well. All right, I've got to speed up. Let's talk about ranges just a little, because ranges offer the, choice, uh, the chance for a new leverage of declarative style. <coughs> this is Eric's original sort of range uh, example from his talk in, in 2015. This is one expression, and composability is, is the key here. It's correct by construction, as he said. And we don't have to do much to convince ourselves that it's correct. It's built that way. Here's another example from the C++ user group, uh, the, the core C++ Israel user group. This code is actually designed for, this is what they use to uh, randomly pick from their RSVPs on meetup.com. This is only part of the code, but the whole program is actually designed to be slide presentable. Um, so there's not much more than this. And, and this whole thing is two declarations and leveraging expressions. Now, you might look at this and think, this is not very readable, not easily readable. So <coughs> I want to make the point that readabil readability is familiarity. So who can tell me what this does? Anyone tell me what language this is? APL, APL yes. This. And this is a Greek letter iota, which gives you a clue. And actually, it's where we get C++'s iota from. <coughs> so what that does is, is this in, in, we might say, old style C++. So is this code correct? What this is doing is, uh, can you look at this and convince yourself what this is doing? It, some, some partial sum, I heard, yes. Yeah, it's a, it's a partial sum. Um, is, th is this code correct? Yes, probably, I think so. What's the performance of this code? We'd, we'd say probably pretty good. We can't do much better. Um, but I'm hearing, you know, I'm not hearing certainty. Uh, you, you have to look at this code. You, you need to look at this code for at least a few seconds to sort of convince yourself what it does. And this code is not particularly likely to retain its properties because over time, people tend to put things in for loops. <coughs> And here's the same code written with algorithms. Uh, now, is this correct? Yeah, 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 it is. So actually, one of the things I wondered about, and one may well reasonably wonder about, is is it legal for partial sum to overwrite what it's, what it's traversing? It turns out it is legal, but that isn't obvious at first blush. <coughs> but other things aside, we are probably we're probably pretty sure that this does what it says on the tin, and it can, and it's like more likely to retain its properties. The ranges version might look like this. Now again, we can be pretty sure this is correct. In fact, this is even correct if we swap over take and partial sum. So, <laughs> so it's 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 more likely to remain correct, I would say, um, and admittedly. You know, you, if you're thinking about performance, you do have to put some trust in the implementer of these functions. Uh, but in this case, you know, the fact they're in the view namespace is a good sign 
that they aren't taking up a lot of space and they only do what they need to do. So my point is here that this is a great example of code that says what instead of saying how. And it, it's maybe not familiar to us from the, from the you know, first example. APL is certainly not familiar to, to me. Uh, but it's more likely to remain robust and more likely to convince ourselves that it's correct by construction. There's, a, there's an analogy here with the Unix pipeline. Uh, ranges uh, have a very strong analogy, and it's all, about, uh, it's all about processing data. So we have my sort of ta taxonomy of things. We have, we have generators, we have selections, transformations. You know, so, so there are Unix pipeline uh, things, and there are things in C++ that do all of these, and there are combos of these. And this is sometimes called whole meal programming in functional circles, as opposed to piecemeal programming of imperative loops and conditions. It's about thinking about how your data gets transformed through a pipeline in a declarative way. <coughs> okay, the other thing that this does, of course, is it supports exploratory work. If you think about using the Unix command line, um, you can stitch these things together any which way and, and do different things in the blink of an eye. You know, you can in five minutes grep your code base for different things, all that. It's very exploratory. So composing these things is very easy, and it kind of it means that you can do things in your code very quickly. All right, now one of the things that Rangers does is it overloads operator uh, bar, the pipe operator. So I do want to address operator overloading in terms of declarative style. We've seen a lot of code already in this talk that overloads operators uh, in the logging code, with the stream operator, in the ranges code, in the test code. <coughs> Declarative style relies a lot on composing expressions. So operators are really important. Operator overloading gets a lot of bad press, though. It seems to be viewed as something that's often abused, <coughs> rarely used to good effect, uh, easily used to bad effect, maybe hiding performance details, things like that. People, people that I come into contact with are typically wary of operator overloading. I think this is a common thing that I've seen online as well. Now, I want to tell you why I think operator overloading is really good when it's principled. So the first thing, and I'm sort of preaching to the choir here, is that regular types we know are great. Uh, and Operators give us, what they give us is compositional style with, in a concise way. Nobody in their right mind would write option one here. I'm assuming, maybe, maybe they would, but, but I, think, I think we can all agree. I don't, think this is un, I don't think this is controversial. We can agree that option two is preferable to option one here. Um, so there's a potential huge readability gain for using operators. So let's explore kind of the boundaries of, and some guidelines for operator overloading. This is an example from Phil Nash's talk. Uh, originally in Catch, he had this command line parser and he broke it out into this library that's now called Clara. This again is using the, the bar, the, uh, the pipe operator to compose <coughs> command line options. I recommend watching the talk. Um, the key here is starting with composability in mind and this leads you inevitably towards unlocking declarative style. And we can see some of the hallmarks of declarative style in this. So the use of expressions, overloading operators, and of course, it's one declaration. So this is, again, code that says uh, what it's doing. It doesn't say how, it doesn't, you don't care how. Um, it just says what. <coughs> so here's some oper operator overloading advice that we've seen. Scott Myers says, when in doubt, do as the ints do. Biana says, that it's wise probably to primarily mimic conventional use of operators. People don't like reusing operators to mean arbitrary non-conventional things. Richard. So that's interesting, but if you take a look at the previous example that we've been seeing about composition, mm -hmm. it wise were operators seem to have now two meters. Right. Do like it, it, well, I guess yes, th there are, I think the common is there are some uses of some operators which are becoming conventional. But the bitwise operator, is, I mean the bitwise or operator is an example we've seen in, in the command line slide and in the ranges. But I guess it does because as things are doing it's more controlled. 
opposing like flags together to mean something larger than itself. So maybe it actually is called the theory of the so, <laughs> so, so it depends, right? Uh, so maybe I'm thinking when in, maybe a good guideline we could try to explore is when in doubt, do what operator plus does, right? Because that that so operator plus is to the operators as ints are to the types. If you like, we're all familiar with it. Way in the back, Lenny. Right. Um, some other convention from somewhere else that people already kind of understand. Yes. So there is the comment is that there is the the point about using operators conventionally isn't just the C plus plus conventions, but in for instance in the case of the pipe operator, that is a well known Unix convention. Yeah, I would agree. So. I, I thought, when in doubt, let's do what operator plus does, right? Because that is, in some sense, a well-known operator. So maybe we should try to find guidelines that we can use from operator plus. <coughs> so I'll ask you, what are some properties that plus has in mathematics? Commutative, it, commutative I heard, associative. I probably heard, I didn't hear some other things. So it's closed, associative, commutative, and it has an identity, right? It's a monoid, we would say. Now, what about C++? Is operator plus closed? Almost. Nearly. <laughs> Nearly. Is it associative? It's closed and signed. It's closed and unsigned, right. Is it associative? Just Not so much in some cases. It's associative on unsigned. It's associative on unsigned. OK. <laughs> <laughs> but it's overloaded in C++, so I'm considering the properties. Is it commutative? No. Not Yep, right, not on strings. Has it got an identity? Depends on the type. Depends on the type. Yes. But pretty much, yes. yes. Sometimes it has two. <laughs> <laughs> now, this aside, you know, the comments, the comments from the audience about unsigned, we do try to follow mostly conventions. And so the operator plus is generally well regarded in that sense. Uh, C++ is not something like JavaScript where Equality isn't an equivalence relation. <coughs> so we do have some con conventions. So equality stuff is pretty math-like. You know, if, if you if you define operator not equal to be something other than not operator equal, you will probably not pass the code review. Similarly with the the uh, ordering operators. When it comes to addition, uh, the, the the mathematical arithmetic operators, we are. We are mostly conventional maths, right? Pa People are saying path and daytime. Yeah, yeah, we are overloading the slash. That, that's, I think, a defensible use. Um, operator bar has, is coming into use as this kind of pipelining operator or uh, composing things monoidally. Uh, if you, if you want to write expression templates and things like that, you might make a lot of use of <laughs> this strange operator. Um, these operators, we just don't overload them. They, because reasons. Um, but all other operators seem to be open for abuse. No. So, bit what? Yeah, there are operators that I haven't mentioned here. You know, this audience is wants to wants to be pedantic. Now, now. I'm just I just pulling out a few examples of operators which I think are, are currently uh, do currently have some kind of conventional style to overloading them or not. Um, but but why why do we overload operators? What do operators actually give us? Now this goes back to I want to look at history again. So in 1956, the IT compiler was an internal translator. It was a compiler for the IBM 650, and it was perhaps the first compiler that we would recognize as a compiler in the modern sense, that it took kind of human readable source and made it into machine code, as opposed to being uh, what were known as compilers back then was anything from like a sort of assembly language. Um, and, and Knuth said it was the first really useful compiler. 
But it lacked one particular thing. It didn't have any kind of operator precedence. Expressions were evaluated left to right, no matter what the intuitive precedence of the operators. And as a consequence, that lack of priority was the most frequent single cause of errors among programmers. So what does that tell us? It tells us, it tells me that <coughs> operators communicate properties in a way that functions don't. They communicate, you know, when I asked you about properties of plus, you immediately said associativity, commutativity, closeness. <coughs> operators make sense for binary functions. There is a concern with operators that um, the C++ compiler is unable to collapse n binary function calls into an nary function call, and that's a valid concern. But when, when the interface to your class is mostly a binary operation, overloading operators makes a lot of sense. Uh, of course, they should be conventional. And the one piece of advice I give here is identify your monoids, um, because if you can do that, you can take advantage of this precisely this communication of properties that operators give you. All other things being equal, shorter code is more reasonable code, uh, uh, more readable code. And uh, we, although we like to stick to convention, we do sometimes get to define our own conventions. As we saw, many, many of the types in C++ don't follow mathemat strict mathematical conventions for operator plus. So we don't need a dogmatic reliance on mathematics. <coughs> so I've hopefully made an argument for declarative code and shown, and shown ways in which uh, it's already in use and guidelines and sort of principles. Um, so let's look at where C++ gives us good support for these kind of constructs and where it can be improved. So first, where do we get good support? Well, whenever we think of C++, the first thing we think of its strength is RAII, initialization. Um, it's the bread and butter of C++ programming and it's a natural fit for a declarative style as, I, as we saw with, for example, the logging. Um, now, initialization uh, gets a lot of scrutiny because it is sort of complex. People say it's for experts. But most cases of initialization are definitely getting easier for regular users. And it, you know, it's getting a lot of, because it's getting a lot of scrutiny and sort of some, some bad press, there's a lot of work going into making initialization better. Um, all of these things, I think, are on that path. And C++ is moving pretty strongly. <coughs> Another great thing, of course, is functions. They turn statements into expressions. That's what functions do. Uh, and we like them for all, the, for all these reasons. Uh, structured bindings, of course, are a great addition because they work around the limitation of just one thing being returned from a function. They allow you to return multiple things atomically, if you like. Uh, and if initializers help with that. Uh, wait, no, if initializers. So if you're thinking about this in the context of if initialization, structured bindings go with it. Uh, although if you're trying to avoid conditions, if initialization might become less important if you want to encapsulate it. Uh, but the principle of useful return from a function is important, and that's supported by structured bindings. Uh, a huge thing in C++ is actually uh, overloading and the ability to have parametric polymorphism via templates. So this simplifies call site code because it, it, it means that you can just rely on the compiler to do the right thing type-wise. This example is from Andy Bond's talk from CPCon 2016. He gives an example of uh, an easy way to make a uniform distribution with any kind of uh, integral type. And this can be extended to, you know, we can do this for floating point types as well. And we can do it, one of the, one of the useful things I have in my code is to have this overloaded for chrono, di chrono durations. One of the things I commonly have to do, as you saw in the schedule example, is something like an exponential backoff where I have to get a random time period sometime in the next duration. And a, 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 a bit of overloading of make uniform distribution here, because chrono durations have as their underlying types either floating point or integral types, it's very easy to write that in terms of the others. It gives me a call site, which is straight line code, no kind of, no kind of uh, decisions about types at the call site. The compiler just does the right thing. 
There's a few other features of C++ which help us. Uh, guaranteed copy elision, of course, is obviously really good for leveraging <laughs> functions. Evaluation order guarantees help with the builder pattern. You saw that. And something I haven't even mentioned, which some of you may be thinking about, fold expressions. Fold expressions uh, magnify the power of operator overloading. They offer you the increased flexibility of your interface and the chance to get any application for free with a simple binary function interface. So again, identify your monoids. This can really help your, your class interfaces and unlock a declarative style, a compositional style for the, for the people using your libraries. So let's look at where C++ is weaker. <coughs> and this is a good conference to, to present that. <coughs> Something we mentioned already uh, about sort of if and c the conditional operator not quite having parity. We gained if initializers in 17. We don't have the equivalent thing for the conditional operator. There's, as, as Gashba mentioned earlier and was mentioned, uh, it's hard to make the parser make sense of this. So it would be nice to have it though. <coughs> we have the heritage of assignment. Um, I've been thinking a lot about this. So there's a real implementation burden around implementing assignment for your class. You've got to, you've got to consider move versus copy and reference qualifiers. You've got to provide operator equals as a member function, but it turns out that operator, you know, uh, operator at equals or plus equals or whatever is allowed to be free. And I'm not sure why that is. Maybe someone could tell me later. Um, remember the Remember the quote from the C++ programming language that it cannot be over overemphasized that assignment and, and, and initialization are different operations. And um, if we're trying to, we're trying to minimize assignment, but we still have this, this uh, burden. <coughs> then we have this odd thing that hits me quite a lot, that the type system is strange around functions. These two things are, for all intents and purposes, the same. That they, the same. they have the same signature, they capture the same things, the closure objects are identical, but they aren't the same type. I can't do this. Um, we have loads and loads of different callable, invocable types in the language, you know, half a dozen at least, uh, but we don't have the ability to do this simple thing. Um, and maybe this is because a function signature is a concept and not actually a type. Uh, I have to think more about this, but we, we, there's, there's room for improvement in this area, I think. Arthur. Well, if they didn't capture any of those, they'd have to be different types, right? They would have no place where the key set function would end up. If they didn't capture anything, they'd have to be different types. Then it would be operator though. If if they didn't capture anything, they would be no, decay no, decayable. They would so they could, they, 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 yes, they would decay the function pointers and they, this would work. Just put a flush in front of your lambda. <laughs> I, but I can't put the plus because they capture. Oh, yeah. Right, that's what I'm saying. They, they, they are identical. As, as humans, we can see that these things, apart from what they do, they have the same interface, they have the same captures. The closure object is going to be identical. But they don't. But they don't quite have the same type. Right. But the closure, op the object representation is identical for both of them. Yes. But they have different behavior, so they have to be different types. There's no way they, else to put the behavior other than the type is. They have different behavior. I can write two regular functions with different, with the same signature, with different behaviors, and they have the same type. Well, yeah, pointers to them have the same but, type. But you're not comparing the closure objects. I. No, I'm. Well. All I'm saying is, I'm saying, there's room for improvement here. We have, <laughs> we have no function have signature same, type, right? Type, they just have different values. Al Alistair. Different types. Same types different values. Value. This, but it is verbose. Yes. Uh, Alistair points out that uh, std function is the way to do this. std function would take care of this, but std function has verbosity and cost. Uh, we don't have function signature types in the language. We, we may, uh, like I said, it may be that a function signature is a concept, and concepts might help here. I talked about operator overloading. 
Operators have uh, this huge potential for unlocking compositional style, declarative style, and expressing code. Unfortunately, operators are one of the parts of the language that gets the least attention. They're really hard to deal with in C++ because you have all of these problems. You, you want to overload, overload an operator. So your first problem is, which operator? You have a fixed set to choose from. <laughs> you have a fixed precedence, which often is the guiding factor in your overloading. They also have fixed associativity, arity, fixity. You can't make infix and postfix and prefix. <laughs> yeah, <laughs> fixed fixity, right? So you can't, you can't change whether it's infix or, pr or prefix or whatever. And they have fixed evaluation semantics, which if you overload those ones that do, will change. Um, so when you come, and then if you deal with all of that and you find an operator which is good for you, then you have to deal with ADL. So it's little wonder that overloading operators is such an unloved part of the language. And Alistair. And the other one you might go there is openness with changing short circuiting. You can't overload the short circuit the way the built-in ones do. Yes, uh, Alistair points out that short circuiting is a problem. So that, that's what I meant by fixed evaluation semantics. <coughs> so right now, overloading operators is socially acceptable if you're writing, let's say, a matrix class and you want to provide arithmetic operators or you're providing a way to print your type and you're overloading the output stream operator, or you know a handful of other things that seem to be gaining currency. Uh, but I would love to see some of these shortcomings tackled. Uh, these are all, when it comes down to it, rules in the compiler, which could be expressed as rules in the language, in much the same way that meta classes are doing that for class, con for class definitions. Um, so I'm wondering if C++ could benefit from something like that for operators. In particular, one of the things I see as a shortcoming is our inability to express uh, monadic sort of composition with these operators. So uh, making no assumption about how my future is implemented. You know, there are several implementations of futures. Uh, but just taking the view that I want to be able to express this composition of computation. I want to run my function f and then run g1 and g2 in parallel and then combine the results into H. At the moment, I, uh, uh, you know, a pretty good future interface right now, as it exists in a, in a, in a well-regarded futures library, might look something like this. I, I run F, and then I do dot then, G1 and G2, and I split it, and then I went all, and I, and, I, and I join it back together. But I would like to write something with operator overloading, because this, this is expressing the structure of the computation to me much more, much better in a way that I can change around if I need to. This, th this operator expression tells me things about the computation that are not nearly as visible in four or five lines of code. Kashba. Why not comma between G1 and G2 if we're still in fiction land? <laughs> yeah, yeah why, why not comma? David. Mm-hmm. She can't do like non-deterministic monads like Alyssa monads. Right. For most things, like including futures, coroutines for that are literally syntax. Okay, <laughs> so the comment is that coroutines can do this. Uh, uh, then that's great. Uh, but I'm still limited to overloading the operators, and I'm still limit limited to the, the, for instance, a lot of people, when they, when they think about writing a monadic future, the natural thing is, you know, they, they know in Haskell that bind is greater than, greater than, equal. And so I see a lot of people who suggest greater than, greater than, equal here. But of course, it has the wrong associativity. It associates to the right because it's in C, it's an assignment operator. Or in C++ as well. So, so yeah, that's right. So the question is, could we combine this with graph, uh, with graph, uh, f with futures uh, from Vittorio's talk? I'm sure we could. Uh, my point here is that operators give you a compositional style. This is one area of C++ I see where expressivity is lacking because of 
because of all the constraints we have around operators and because of the fact that historically we haven't we haven't thought about monadic compositions and so we're trying to shoehorn existing operators yeah the concept of uh, composing things with operators, great, and, but that's sort of orthogonal to the point I'm making here, which is we, we don't have the expressivity of the operators in C++. So yeah, I think there's general agreement in the audience that this, this something like this is nicer than something like this. <coughs> All right, so that's what convention are we going to adopt for monadic operators? That's the question I have. And, and please let's, let's not abuse more operators. All right, where C++ is getting better? We have a lot of, as I mentioned, imperative safety gear. Uh, we're getting better warnings, static analysis, several things in the language that help us enforce these things. Um, the if initializer, I think, is going to really help with avoiding assignment in the, in the if expression. <coughs> uh, to, no discard to me could be another default. I'd like to put it on all my functions and see what happens. Is it is it a default that we got the wrong way around? I'm wondering. Um, declaration syntax is getting is getting better. Uh, now this this was great in 1972, um, but now we are getting we are getting better. You know, uh, to me the, the the best example of this is using over type def. Uh, I was always confused with type def a little bit. Um, in particular, function pointer types are much easier now to, to read to me. Um, another place where we're getting better, actually, which is, which is not somewhere that you really think of unless, unless you sort of use it all the time, is in the richness of library help that we're getting. There are an increasing number of small, seemingly unimportant helper functions in, that are coming into the standard library, and sometimes they're functions, sometimes they're meta functions, they can be really important in, in avoiding conditionals. Uh, things like std exchange, std as const, std apply, uh, more and more type traits, monadic interfaces, std optional, which I know Simon Brand has been working on, for instance. Uh, so there are things already that we have, there are things being proposed, and it's not immediately obvious to you with these small functions sometimes, what their purpose is, if you're thinking in the imperative mm -hmm. style. But when you start thinking about a declarative style and a style which minimizes conditions, especially, then these things become uh, more obvious in their use, or at least, you, you. these are a couple of examples that, that aren't in the library right now, but are sort of from functional languages. So identity is, 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 is forward, except it, it uh, deduces its type. Uh, std identity was actually in the original STL, but it was left on the cutting room floor when it was standardized. Uh, if you do template metaprogramming, of course, you're well, you're well aware of identity as a meta function. Um, template metaprogramming doesn't really have assignment. It doesn't, it's not an imperative style. So by nature, it is declarative. So identity gets a lot of currency in template metaprogramming, or you know, common type. Common type T is used for identity as well. Uh, this always function, again, it's one of these things that it, at first glance you look at it and you think, what use do I have for that? Uh, it's a function that simply captures its argument and then returns you a function. Whatever you call that function with, it's going to return the argument that was captured. And <laughs> somebody in the audience is chuckling. So, so these are examples of things that when you look at them from the imperative point of view, you think, well, that that's useless. Why would anyone ever use that? But when you come to think declaratively and you think about, I want to encapsulate conditions, I want to remove <coughs> conditions from my business logic and either encapsulate them in, a, in an algorithm or in some lower level thing or hoist them up to where the user can, can uh, think about them in OO style, things like this become very important for building your code. So the meta guideline is avoid writing statements, principally control flow and assignment. How do you avoid that? Uh, well, avoiding conditionals, as I've said, sort of depends on your, your par paradigm. We sometimes do it in imperative code even. Uh, we sometimes do multi-computation. This is actually much more common at a very low level. The compiler eliminates conditions. The compiler eliminates branches. Uh, you, if, you, if you program on, on some 
some hardware you might want to use intrinsics to eliminate branches. So we, we occasionally do that, not very often. Uh, in object orientation, to eliminate conditions, we use polymorphism. In functional style, of course, function call is the signature element, and we do it with functions. Everything is done with functions in functional style. And in generic code, well, it's the static equivalent of object-oriented code a lot of the time, so we, we, we eliminate conditions with type traits. So this is sort of, I call this the conditional replacement meta pattern. And it unlocks replacing conditions in your logic in all these cases, and it turns statements into expressions according to the domain. So two ways to eliminate conditions. Either you push them down or you push them up. Pushing them down means, well, it's very suited to things like where, where the condition is somehow encapsulated in a data structure, like, a, like an optional. And, and in that sense, you handle a condition at the leaf like you would handle an error. You don't let it leak. Um, and when you push it up, that's what we call dependency injection, higher order functions. It gives the power to the caller of your code, and it takes the conditions, again, out of the business logic. The goal here, as you may have noticed, is total functions, functions that don't uh, depend on some condition on their input, but you can just, you can just call them. <coughs> when you replace or encapsulate conditionals, you get all of these benefits. This, these are very similar to the benefits that you get when you replace loops with the no raw loops uh, guideline that we're all used to. When you replace assignments, you get to leverage the power of return, you get leveraging const, you get leveraging AAA style, and you get to leverage operator overloads for their compositional power. So, you know, the subtitle of the talk was easy to use and hard to misuse. Easy to use is giving your, giving your users the ability to compose. Hard to misuse is, in some sense, making the types work for you. And they go very well together. The other thing you can do is let the language help you with imperative safety gear, as I call it. All these things, a lot of things that we're spending a lot of brain power on these days. Um, and for declarative interfaces, I can offer these guidelines. Let your users, you know, dependency inject, use higher order functions, like we said before. The builder pattern is very useful with, with the guidelines I mentioned. Identify your monoids is key to leveraging operator overloading and start with composition in your interfaces. So declarative code is using expressions over statements. It's preferring declarations over assignments and it's using unconditional code. Thank you very much. <laughs> Ashba. You said identify your monoids. Yes. Um, I've been thinking a lot about this, uh, and I'm often missing some kind of an additive monoid trace for my types. Uh, because I really want the unit, and sometimes the false construction doesn't make sense. Yes, and that was a slight, so, so Gashford's comment is uh, under, the, under the goal of identifying your monoids, we would like something that abstracts the idea of an additive monoid uh, and a unit, and uh, default construction sometimes doesn't make sense. I agree, I agree. Default construction a lot of times is used because that's what we think we should do, because that's what we think is required. I tend to scrutinize default construction, and I don't like to use it if I don't need it. Tom. Uh, just to pick up a lot of things that every conditional in the code, at a minimum, requires one additional test, and may require up to two extra tests that you have. Right, so the observation is every conditional in the code, at minimum, requires one, one test, and may require more. May yes? require doubling. May require doubling, oh, tests, sorry. <laughs> That kind of test, yes. I was a bit confused because I thought, wait, a test is a conditional. Yes, requires requires testing. Yes, requires testing each branch. So, Jason, would you consider going so far as to disable uh, assignments, like deleting your assignment operators and stuff, to enforce this kind of? Thing? 
Would I consider going as far as uh, disabling assignment? I have experimented with returning void from the assignment that operator. The I, I have done that because I, I, so first I grep my code base for chained assignments and I found none right. in a multiple hundreds thousand line code base. Uh, it's not something I see a need for, for any reason really. Uh, so, so certainly returning void from assignment is something I would like to experiment with. Uh, it, it may not fit too well with, you know, the STL or things that I have to depend on is, is the problem. <coughs> Uh, if as long as you have swap, you might not need it. Could, yeah, let's talk afterwards. Uh, sorry, I think so over here was. How do you identify your monoids in practice? Uh, well, I don't have a good example to give you in the time that we have. Um, I'm not sure. It comes down to practice and thinking about. It's thinking about things first from a compositional style, really. So if you start to think, I always think when I'm writing an interface, what types am I providing to the users of this interface? And what can those types do? And can those types be composed? For example, the schedule is a great, is a great one. So I presented a builder interface for schedule. But schedule is a monoid, right? Because you, you, add two you concatenate two schedules together, what you get is a schedule. The, the unit is the do-nothing schedule. And uh, they're associative, yes. Uh, so although I don't have, I have a builder interface for schedule, I don't have a monoidal interface, uh, but it is a monoid. Cash where you can say. Yeah. All right, thank you very much.